Welcome to Story Talk, a roundtable discussion on a single story at a time. Story Talk is a production of One Week Critique, an Iowa based arts and education nonprofit that offers educational resources and editorial support to students and teachers of the literary arts. You can learn more about us and our programs or support our work by visiting our Patreon page or by going to our website, OneWeekCritique.com. That's the number one, Week Critique. Dot com. I'm Matthew Schmidt, here with Adam Alsergani. Hello. And Ingrid Wensler. Hey. Today we'll be discussing Lady, originally from This Is About the Body, the Mind, the Soul, the World, Time, and Fate by Diane Davis. <laughs> <Williams. laughs> we happen to be looking at it in a copy of Excitability, Selected Stories, from 1986 to 1996. Diane Williams is known for short fiction. The Paris Review pronounced her, quote, the godmother of flash fiction, end quote. And Lady, at less than three pages, is not long, though longer than many other stories she's written. The premise is simple. A lady stops at the narrator's house to use the telephone as she's having trouble reaching her friend Merla. Before the lady can leave the house and rendezvous with Merla, the narrator forces her to stay. Uh, before we move deeper into Lady, I thought we could discuss what makes a story flash or short short. Although the terms are relatively new, concise writing is not. Yeah. Uh, how do you understand the genre, its attributes, and what makes it successful? Yeah, it's a beautiful day here in Solon, Iowa, and Ingrid and I were taking a walk earlier and sort of hashing out the ineffability of genres. And I think the newness of the idea of flash fiction is one that actually like I struggle with a lot um, because I think it infers that it does something that other kinds of stories don't or couldn't do. And I don't know that that's true. Um, I think that flash fiction or short fiction is usually, I mean, the, the number one criteria is that it is brief and people like with a novel right they're going to define that in page count or word count or it's going to be slightly different based on who the publisher is so it's more of a, a publishing concern term whether that's i mean in this case for a literary magazine or to define a type of collection than it is like a functional thing i think the other thing is that somehow that compression is going to tends to force short short stories or flash fiction toward using poetical tools so the way in which language is used isn't more significant than it is in another kind of short story but where the language and its multivalences tends in general uh, to become more significant and I, I know that Ingrid is gonna like key off on this so I'm gonna let her go with it but one thing we were hashing out was that, you know, if we were thinking about the novel or the novella, that there are a lot of examples of great novels like The Castle or The Good Soldier Schweig that are great. And there's something about that that works really, really well, despite the fact that they're not finished. But I really have a hard time imagining a successful, unfinished <laughs> flash fiction and so I think that actually completion of the task that that finishes and returns us to the beginning of that church or ends up becoming part of the thing, which sounds like a more prof professorial kind of stomp on the table than it is. I think I don't know, which is my, my real answer. Other than it's like I can read it in five to ten minutes, I have no idea. That's, that's my real answer. <laughs> I think, unfortunately, uh, my answer is similarly not an answer. Um, I think because I've been um, reading the manuscript of um, a friend who's um, very much engaged with film, um, Nick Greer, he has um, a wonderful publication called Goodnight Sweet Prince, which focuses on secondary characters in film that you should check out if you haven't already. 
Um, but you know, he, he thinks and he looks at literature a lot in terms of film and uses film to better understand literature and vice versa. And you know, I think in trying to to think about this question, a lot of what I thought about is like, okay, um, in terms of the short form, like what makes it short? That it actually is short. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I started thinking a little bit about um, this short film that I've been watching most mornings um, called Rain by Joris Ivins. Um, and, you know, I, I was trying to think about something I could say about short, <laughs> short fiction or short films, some sort of rule that I could put forth, like, there are no line breaks ever. <laughs> or, you know, there's always a character or images must be rich and strong. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I... I was thinking about this short movie and what it does, and it's long for a short movie by today's standards, and it focuses just on a rainy day in Amsterdam, and the city is the only protagonist, um, and, you know, I mean, a thing I can say about that particular short movie is that um, the shots are... There are a lot of transitions, a lot of short shots, um, about three or four seconds each. And I love watching all of them. Every moment's interesting to me. Um, I think you could say the same of a strong novel, though, um, or a strong feature. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's very hard to generalize about these things. Um, I think that one's an interesting one to look at because there is no character, there's not much in the way of plot, it's kind of long for a short, um, there's not a lot of change or movement, it, it breaks a lot of rules, but, um, you know, it's terrific, and I wouldn't want it shorter, I don't think I want it longer, um, but I think one thing I was thinking about in terms of thinking about these forms of length is, is frame, and what's within the frame and what's not, and you know, I think some of what what makes it hard to generalize about is that um, I think often in good shorter or longer fiction or film, um, there's spillage. Um, like a good short feels very contained, but you're thinking about what's happening outside of the frame too. And it's kind of running back into the frame and running back out again. And, um, likewise with longer stuff. Yeah, I think that one thing Ingrid is hitting on that I like that might be not a rule of flash fiction but makes sense to me about flash fiction is that, right, like both of both of necessity and market, like there are tendencies within longer forms that happen and, right, like it's sort of hard to imagine a, like, protagonist less um, or sort of largely uncharacter unpopulated novel um, or the sort of trick of doing that might get tedious over time and sure. it's easier to imagine the success of a short short and I think part of why this question is so hard is that like the poem and there are long poems, but it's also harder to sustain a book-length poem um, without narrativizing across the poem. Is, um, is that, um, or just harder to sustain a book-length poem, is that compression has this proliferation because we don't get irritated as easily with the sort of trick of language or the like focus of language in a short space I think sort of human attention, maybe, you know, in the 21st century where we read tweets more than we read short stories or something, um, maybe just in general human attention works that way, that for three to five pages I can sustain all kinds of possibilities, um, but a novel length book about the rain in Amsterdam without any particular focus on a character is one that I have a hard time imagining or a novel or like a, a feature length film uh of that is one i have a hard time imagining in a way that i don't have a hard time imagining a short film 
about that. Um, I think that's well put. Um, some of why I, I struggle and feel a little sheepish answering this question is because the three of us all took a class on the short form, and I feel like I should have, you know, a better... Yeah. <laughs> But, <laughs> I don't know, um, a clearer answer to this, but I mean, I think a lot of what I discovered in that class is, is possibility. Um, we, we worked with this tremendous um, anthology, I think, I think it's my favorite anthology, um, called Short, edited by Alan Ziegler, um, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce his last name, I'm kind of awful with pronunciation. Um, I did want to read one of my favorite shorts from it because I think it it touches on um, what can be so good about a certain kind of short, although um, some of what's so fabulous about the anthology is while it's limited and focused mainly on Western literature, it, um, it goes all over the place and uh, just has such tremendous work. Um, so this is by, I, I'm also going to really struggle to pronounce this. I know um, his name is pronounced in a way that's totally unintuitive to me, so I'm gonna, just going to spell it and cop that. Uh, it's G-A-E-L, um, and he's Scottish, and then it's Turnbull. <laughs> um, so the, the short is this. In the corner of a railway station, he notices a young couple sleeping, their heads on their rucksacks while the commuters hurry past and the taxis sound nearby. They appear to be students, and he remembers his own youth, the hitchhiking, the overnight buses, the post-war cafes, his digs, the girls for whom he yearned, his incoherence, his shame, even the occasional moments of camaraderie or happiness piercing him, even yet by their intensity and brevity. Search though he may, he can find nothing durable for which he might have nostalgia until it comes to him. Their ability to sleep, curled up, oblivious, while the world crashes forward about their ears. Um, I think what succeeds about that one for me is um, the amount of time it manages to cover in a short space and it fits a whole lot within the frame without feeling too much to me like it's summarizing and it feels accurate to how he might be thinking about that moment and you know I mean I think it really reaches for movement at the end and kind of comes to this lovely conclusion while still being really specific to scene and I mean doing the work that you, know, you could spend 20 pages doing um, in this very short space um, I think a true gem there yeah I I, I just wanted to bring this up because we hadn't really discussed it though we've probably done at least two short shorts that i can think of the uh kawabata's pretty short yeah. and the bull is also really short that we did yeah, yeah. depending on your definition of length i think yeah. both of them and kawabata is definitely yeah. generally grouped in yeah short short because of how he sort of branded himself <laughs> yeah and, and I, I agree with both of you i don't really my only, like, the only definition that I might, like, add is one wherein a short, a short, short, a flash piece is when you complete reading in one sitting. Yeah. Like, maybe that's the only thing I would add. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, if you're reading a novel or something longer, you might have to get up and eat. Yeah. You might read it over, like, two weeks, several months, depending on the length of these things. Yeah. And... Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, there has been seemingly a bigger proliferation in literary magazines of Flash and short shorts because I think attention span, but also, you know, print magazines, it costs money per page. And I think one thing you can do is get more people in by using Flash. But with a lot of magazines and journals going online, it still is a thing where, you know, a person can come to the page and read the whole thing yeah. before leaving the site. Yeah. Um, 
anyway, I just wanted to bring it up more as uh, yeah. this is a category that happens. Yeah. And, you know, if you hear it somewhere. Yeah. And I think it's something we don't cover as much in part because doing a podcast that usually lasts 45 minutes to an hour and a half, uh, there's a different level of success with different short shorts as there's a different level of success with stories. But, you know, it's hard to cover the entirety of Toni Morrison's short stories in any one sitting, <laughs> let alone the story, which tends to be longer. Um, and that, you know, um, I think plays into all that since I think it was worth sitting down and chatting that one out. <laughs> all right. So uh, to look more closely at this story, uh, I'm just going to read the first paragraph of Lady Here by Diane Williams. She said, please. Her face looked something more than bitter, with hair which it turned out was a hat, which came down over her ears, which was made of fake fur which she never removed from her head. She had glasses on. Everything she wore helped me decide to let her in. So Williams varies her sentence structure throughout, sometimes employing short paratactic statements, sometimes longer hypotactic sentences that seem to twist both around themselves while also branching out. Would you break down her writing style and how her choices affect the story and your reading of the story? Um, sure. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, I I think the first thing that I would note is that the story begins in medias res um, and kind of throws us into a situation. Um... And we're immediately pointed to sort of inconsistencies and instabilities. Um, And one thing that I I noticed even on first read about the shorter and longer sentences is that the shorter lines tended to be more sure of themselves. And the longer lines would have sometimes doubt folded into them or revelation folded into them or you know, something to do with um, a less um, emphatic statement. Um, And, you know, I guess I would say about the shorter lines and the emphatic statements that I don't always buy the narrator's um, logic or ascribe to it, um, but it's presented as more certain. um, And I, I think it's a really sharp move. I think often language will work that way. Um, I think also um, the lines create um, pacing and movement. Um, I was reminded of um, being in high school with um, this teacher I really admired, um, Dr. De Gennaro, and he um, he was teaching Hemingway and Matthew Arnold both, and um, with the two of them, he pointed out something that's since come to mean a great deal to me, and I, I don't see it as often in literature as I'd like, but um, moments where um, the prose will actually mirror an action, um, so something that he pointed to in a particular um, portion of The Sun Also Rises was, um, you know, a moment where the bullfighting, the, the bullfighters' movements were short and sort of staccato, and so was the prose, and then the movements would become longer, and, you know, as he was turning his, his oh my god, flag, scarf, um, I, I wish I knew the terminology now. Um, I think it's a cape in bullfighting. Yes. But I'm not positive about that. <laughs> well, we'll go with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's been a while for me. Forgive me. Um, but, you know, I mean, the movement was, was meant to mirror the action, um, long story short. And likewise, reading Dover Beach, um, sometimes the movement of the waves um, would mirror um, the poetics there. And I noticed that Williams is sometimes up to that. Um, I can point to some examples. 
women pages, that would be. Um, so in the conclusion, um, it was a lapse to reckon with. I took her into my arms so that she could never leave me and then jammed her up into the corner with the jumble by the front door and held her in there, exhausting myself to keep her in there. Um, there, like the action of getting exhausted and moving in that way, you know, I mean, it's not as descriptive as the bullfighting and like the exact movements and action there, but there the prose does something a little similar. And then in the opening, too, um, she said, please, her face looked something more than bitter, with hair, which it turned out was a hat, which came down over her ears, which was made of fake fur, which she never removed from her head. Um, there, it's the thinking that is mirrored in the sentence. You, get, you see the revelation as it comes, as the narrator experiences it. So um, I think that's something that Williams is playing with there. Um, and then to go back to where I started with the medias race thing, I think formally by choosing to to put us in the middle of this story, um, what Williams does is, you know, teaches us to inhabit the speaker's point of view and to this particular moment um, which I think is really crucial to how the story gets told. I'll, I'll save some of those thoughts for a little later and kind of pass the baton to Adam for now. But. Yeah, I think that I'm really interested in, right, both what Matthew brought up about paratactic and hypotactic sentences, but also about entering into the story and Medius race. So for those who aren't following that, one is Matthew's referring to the way in which the sentences are sort of broken up so that subject and like predicate are not necessarily together and we have these clauses interrupting right which which and so on and so forth and that what Ingrid's referring to is that the story time is <laughs> yeah, we're starting thank you right for like, defining there. yeah you <laughs> should have done that off the bat that the story time is like starting not when the narrator first sees or encounters the lady but when something's already happening. And I think on top of that, part of what's interesting about Diane Williams and her style to answer Matthew's question is that in this particular instance, but also I'm new to Diane Williams, but I see her doing this in the limited other work that I've seen of hers, um, that time isn't necessarily linear. So we're mm. both starting while the action is happening but we're being told from a future time when the action has already happened, which skews the story in two ways. One is that I'm getting a reflective thought, but the way I'm getting a reflective thought is not from the beginning, but in the middle of something happening. And I think interestingly in this story, sort of what you're getting at, Ingrid, is that like because I'm getting it in that way, some of the thoughts I'm getting are a little anxious and they're not necessarily linear, right? And I had all these students when I was teaching more regularly and they would get really hung up on the term then, which I realized was a Jonathan Franzen prejudice. In some like interview, he laid out a set of like seven or eight rules. I don't remember now, but one of the things Jonathan Franzen hates is the use of then because he thinks it's always useless. And I'm sure that like all of us, when we make big statements, like Jonathan Franzen would admit that sometimes the word then has a utility. And one of those things, I think the way when you read that interview, it seems like, or that statement, it seems like what he's saying is that then is useless because anytime you say thing A, then thing B, you just automatically assume thing A happened and then thing B happened. But in this particular story, Right, like <laughs> there's um, there's a situation that we're dealing with where because it's reflective, this person is thinking about it after it happened. That the things we're being told aren't necessarily in order, although they're also in order. You see the hat as hair, you see the hat as hat, but you don't necessarily see the way in which she never took it off and what's happening around that. 
and part of the genius of the short short is that we're going to, I think you can't read this short short once. You have to go back and go, oh, God damn. Like, that's horrifying when I read it a second time. Um, as I'm sure it will be horrifying to listen to that dog in the distance bark at me while I say that when I hear this recording. Indeed. Um, yeah, I mean, right, like, I said earlier that the story is simple. And, yeah. and like, it is. The, the, the premise. Yeah. The premise is The premise simple. is. <laughs> it, it, it's in these, like, the details and the actions and the way the sentences are structured that, you know, really informs how you move through and think about things within the story. And I think she does a great job with evocation. Um, and that complicates the simplicity of the premise. And, and I was wondering, you know, how do you understand the narrator and the action in the story through the details that the narrator gives us? Yeah. Um, man, that's, and this is a phenomenal question. It's also really like, it's, I think because this story is so dense and so tightly written, it's a little bit hard to reference without speaking to exactly what it's doing. So you read the first paragraph. I'm going to read a little from the second paragraph. She wore black patent leather shoes with pointed toes, with black stockings, wrinkled at the ankles, with silver triangles set in on top of the toes of the shoes to decorate them. And she had on a long black coat, and she was shorter than I am. And that's <laughs> that whole paragraph <laughs> is, is one sentence, by the way. Um, and I tried to read where the commas were, but also like it's comma heavy. But I think some of what we learn about that narrator is right. Like you often might see someone. I had a, a phenomenal teacher, John Don Haman, uh, who uh, did this exercise with us one time about identifying a suspect. This is in high school, and. He had somebody come and steal something off of his desk, and then he had people explain what happened in writing. And it's next to impossible. And even when you know it's going to happen, everyone gets the story wrong and different. Um, there's something about this narrator and the specificity of things, but also the interpretive specificity. It's not just that this narrator notices patent leather shoes with pointed toes with black stockings, wrinkled at the <laughs> wrinkled at the ankles which is a lot of noticing with silver triangles set in on top of the toes of the shoes to decorate them it's that odd phrasing to describe that the triangles are to decorate them as if anyone who just didn't have <laughs> footwear described <laughs> with its decorations wouldn't know that it's to decorate. And so we're learning something about the way that mind works. And that mind also in that hypertension knows something about say, later we're gonna learn that the lady is trying to find someone named Merla. And we learn the narrator assumes that he or she knows the distance that Merla is from the house they're in but also that the lady knows that distance and it's based on the way in which the lady can't find Merla. And I think there's a hyper logic to that, that uh, without diagnosing or specifying or overthinking what this person is thinking like, we learn from the very specific way those details are shared and the way that that language is shared. Um, she, I'm going to give one more example. Is She said, quote, I have a, end quote, M dash, something, something, M dash, quote, reproduction, quote, I cannot remember the dates or the royal reign to which she referred when she was toying with this miniature chair that I have, grabbing it by its arm, and swiveling it on the clubbed foot of one leg as she was leaving after everything had been agreed upon with Marla, period. 
She would not be getting out of her car for Marla, period. Marla would meet her at the corner, period. Marla would. I was... <laughs> uh, that's an insane way to think about, I think, but also the, like, the odd specificity of not needing you to know that there's a something, something that got said and that I didn't, as never how I would tell you a story. I'd just tell you, like, she said something like, or I'd just pretend like I'd heard the thing and remembered the thing. There's something about that narrator that needs you to know something very accurate, despite that ultimately what this story is going to tell us is horrifying. In and out. <laughs> yeah, so um, just to remind listeners of the premise, because, you know, we state, and Matthew stated it um, really succinctly in the introductory material, but... Um, you know, we we all talk fast. We all say a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens in this story is the narrator lets um, this lady in to use um, his, her, their phone and um, then keeps this woman forcibly um, in his, her, their apartment. Um so, I mean, I, I think this is a tremendous question, um, Matthew, and I mean, one of my, in some ways one of my favorites to answer um, because it's complicated like this story. Um, I think as, as a reader trained to read, um, I try to understand what happens within the frame of the story in terms of its detail. Um, and I certainly try to do this um, with this story, especially because I'm surprised by the ending and pitched back into it. And I try to look for clues, but I mean, I also, um, not to chew my own horn, but I feel like I've, I've read enough that, you know, I, there are things I notice on first read that, that stand out to me as things to pay attention to. And one that comes in the first par paragraph is, Everything she wore helped me decide to let her in. Um, you know, in terms of what I've gotten from this story so far, which is nothing about this woman even coming to the door, there's something about that emphatic statement that tells me, like, this is important. Pay attention to what she's wearing. It's going to tell me something about this mind. Um, and... I mean, what I wonder about this story and some of why it's fascinating is what I actually do know about the narrator based on these details, because, um, you know, it's, it's truly a study in, <laughs> of contrasts and of making, you know, a fool of the attentive reader in some ways. Um, and that, you know, I, I'm like, okay, pay attention to what she's wearing and what it means and... I, I'm bad at paying attention to titles and how they frame things, but I'm like, okay, take lady, take what this woman's wearing, and what is that up to? Do, does this add up to lady, to, to my mind? And, I mean, yes and no. They're, you know, she's wearing black stockings, but they're wrinkled at the ankles. Um, there are things like that. Um, in terms of the third paragraph we get, we get that her skin was a bleak sort of skin. And there was no beauty left in her, maybe in her body. So, you know, in that second read, I'm like, okay, this narrator has forcibly <laughs> kept this woman yeah. in this apartment. Um, and I, I want to say, based on those lines, that it's not because of a physical kind of attraction but I, I don't feel like I can even conclude that, honestly, um, because of the ambivalence and because that may be part of the attraction. This is a mind that wants to push you in that way, and that's some of what I find you know, so fascinating about this, um, that the contrasts could potentially be the desirability and that you know, we're forced into this sort of like amateur sleuthing position as readers. Um, in one of my, my favorite <laughs> lines, this story, um, 
or little paragraphs in the story, just because it's so it's so bizarre to me. I just, I just love this. It's, it comes right after the body thing. I felt that this lady is fast because she was at the place where I keep my red rotary dial phone before I was, after I said, the phone is in here. Sure. <laughs> what I love about this is in the first clause, the I felt that this lady is fast is very funny to me. Um, you know, it's something that you'd say casually in speech, but that you wouldn't usually put in a short, the story this short, unless you're trying to capture something about boys. But because of the unusual narrator we're dealing with, there's something about the felt that reads is very, very funny to me. Um, but, you know, I think on second read, being a little lazy as a reader, the thing I wanted to do was say, okay, like, some of the attraction to this woman is that she's catchable. Um, and she's not, that she's, um, because she's described as shorter than the narrator in another place. Um, she's presumably a little bit older, um, although that may be me assuming. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I see in this line that this narrator is assessing and paying attention to this woman's speed, but... You know, there's something complicated there. Like, is the desirability that she she is a little bit hard to catch, maybe like physically quick moving through a room, or or is it not? Yeah, well, um, and I think that part of what you're on to that's really smart about that line is that on right, like the kind of oddity of the kinds of description that we have, the like the complex sentences that we get don't i think on first read they take you to like this is an idiosyncratic narrator who says that like you know they're experiencing this woman is fast right right but right like on second read right like we don't actually know what happens other than that the narrator has kept this woman and there are indications that eventually she does get to merla so we don't know what happens exactly how violent it is, whether or not it's sexual. But I think that some of what works there is that like that feeling of fastness can be a presumption of like sexual liberality, right? Like, which I think like is usually, you know, assumed to be like, yeah, that's how like, it feels. Yeah. Read that it it first. Like, <laughs> yeah. And it like, but also it's about speed and catchability. And then that sizing up thing, like whether or not this is like, sort of a narcissistic thinking about like this woman's vulnerability, right? As is, right? Like she's a lady or right? Like whether or not it's just sheer politeness in the lady statement, right? Like I think that you mentioned she might be a little older as part because of the specificity of that language that is, right? Like that she doesn't have that beauty left as if she had it and has aged out of it. Yeah, and I think yeah, there's no, things exactly. are, and, and some some of the dialogue around Merla and her behaviors um, yeah. suggest that. But. It's also, I don't, um, right, like, these stories are between 1986 and 1996, and even then, a woman named Merla was <laughs> probably, <laughs> uh, probably no, in her 50s at best. In that way. Yeah, it's, no, it's I, I think that's, that's part of the, like, what's so successful about the story up and down is that that very like choice driven language um which yeah well yeah i mean you know speaking of lady right like this this story is concerned with manners right it's it's important manners are important to the narrator uh though it seems that the narrator's feelings often overwhelm civility yeah um you know what what transgressions take place in the story and how do these transgressions inform character? Yeah, I think it's weird for someone to come into your home in most spaces if you don't know them. And so the whole story is based on, right, like we learn in that first paragraph you read that the narrator, right, like we're actually misled by that, right? Like that which she removed from her head. She had glasses on. Everything she wore helped me decide to let her in. That 
the clothing she has on infers something about comfort. This isn't, right, which is part of the delusion of all of our lives, that somehow the way what we wear or what we, like, do during our day-to-day -day makes us safe or not safe to other people. Um, but also the narrator has encountered this lady, we learn a little bit later, by, like, watching her call out to someone, right? And so, like, the way in which that goes from... I think for me on first read, right, like this woman outside yelling is not a lunatic or not mentally ill or what have you or anything that scare me, but rather the narrator can reach out to her because, hey, I see you're in trouble and I'm willing to help someone who is a lady who has such a nice hat on, who has such nice patent leather shoes. And those things end up being really significant to what would happen normally and not normally, right? Like my grandmother, for whatever reason, would never let anyone come into her house to do plumbing, etc., without, um, you know, being there herself. She'd like lay out her whole day around watching that happen. Um, and I think that that isn't that weird. Most of us feel uncomfortable in that of course, then there's the narrator. The big one is whatever happens with the narrator, to whatever extent it happens, um, the narrator entraps someone in his or their home. And that's horrifying in a stranger's home, right? The lady also, when she gets in the home, she's fast. She moves quickly into that space and inhabits it as if her own. So it's not just that she's been invited inside, which is a little odd, but once she's invited inside, there's a liberality to moving the table with a club foot, um, which I'd pointed to earlier. There's this attention to the artwork that it's hard to tell because of the narration whether or not that attention is sort of like a little too much or whether it's like polite, like now I'm in your house calling my friend. So like, by the way, this is a kind of nice like, piece you have here. Um, and then there's the exposure, right? Like, We're going to get to this a little later, I'm sure, but of the oddities of that house and the oddities of the narrator's behavior when it isn't about entrapping someone in a house. And I, I think there's a sense about that the like i mean you go into somebody's house and you're like that motherfucker shouldn't live like that you know like which is actually kind of like out of line for most of the time for us to do about other people if they're living comfortably in their own space but there is a sense of offense we take at the way other people live even when it doesn't like you know it's one thing when someone's like you know running an unlicensed morgue in their basement or something that might potentially like damage our health but like it's a very different thing you're just going in like i can't believe they have that artwork on their wall um and there's a sense of that maybe happening but it's a little hard to grasp yeah um sorry that was a litany of transgression without much commentary on it no no i um I, I think all of that is um, on point. I, I think um, besides the title, the moment where I really know um, in a, like, I'm, I'm sure of this kind of way that this, this narrator is paying attention to manners um, is, I mean, like, I, I get clues all along the way, but um, we find out that the narrator has lied um, to um, the woman that she lets in and um, says, all that I knew was that I'd done something unforgivably uncivil. Um, there are a lot of like, logical <laughs> um, and cognitive errors around this. <laughs> what, what the narrator has done is... Um, given this person the wrong address when they're trying to find where they're going, right? Um, and reversed um, the numbers of the address. Um, but 
you know, what an important little subcause, but I did not know I had done that. Um, so, I mean, you get evidence of some, like, impulse control issues there, um, or at least... Or, um, like, just untrustability issues. Or, yeah, or, I mean, lack of awareness about what you're doing as you're doing it, yeah. all kinds of things you, you could conclude. But, um, you know, I, I think this is a story that through and through pays a lot of attention to a certain kind of etiquette, and it's... It's kind of quiet in places, but um, you know, depending upon like the particular place you're from, you might you might map it to your space. And I, I pay a lot of attention to the fact that the narrator's noting that the woman's wearing black stockings, but that they're wrinkled at the ankles. Um, I pay a lot of attention to the way that the woman that she's let in, or yeah, he she there is letting in and we don't know the gender um, or sex of the narrator um, but the way the woman let into the space is behaving within the space um, she nearly knocks over a lamp she's touching furniture um, this is a little detail but in the first paragraph her hat is made out of fake fur not real fur um, She's lost in this space, um, and it's kind of demanding to her friend Merla about picking her up, even though Merla's very close by, um, in a way that might indicate um, entitlement and wealth, or might indicate um, like a lack of manners or politeness, um, consideration for a friend. I mean, really, she's not being very considerate of Merla, whatever her class. <laughs> um, I, I think, Adam, you're, you're smart to point to the art thing. I think that is kind of at, at least in a certain kind of East Coast space. Like, you might pay attention to um, artwork before you pay attention to a home and note that about a space, but not other things, which is a quiet thing and yeah. a thing that becomes really crucial, actually, in a small way. Um, this is something that the narrator says about this lady. She, the lady, must have been curious or put off by the jumble of dirty things at my front door that I suppose she first noticed when she was leaving, or by the splendor of my living room just off from the jumble. She missed going inside of it to see what was going on in each of the pictures in there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the jumble later. Um, and some of these other spatial details, but the woman's paying attention to the pictures and not to the space. Yeah. And I get the feeling that that might be part of, in my amateur sleuthing, um, why she's in trouble. Um, that at once this narrator is wanting a lady and wanting a certain kind of manner, but also wanting divergence or transgression. Um, to use Matthew's word, that, you know, if I can, as an amateur sleuth, like, piece together something this, this story could be saying, it's that, like, the wrinkles of the stocking are part of the, part of the alert, potentially, that you have to belong enough, but kind of not belong, because this narrator might be, like, a little self-hating when it comes to this manner stuff. Yeah, well, I also I might add that to the looking and observation that, right, like, one thing that the story will not answer in terms of, like, in this short space, and part of what's interesting about what it doesn't answer is when I think about the literal things that happen and when I try and rearrange this story into a linear chronology of what happened. I think there's a certain kind of, right, like there's a reason that we have different words like look at, stare at, ogle, um, or like, you know, Looney Tunes wolf eye, you know? And like, I, I think that when I imagine this sort of interaction, the sort of analysis of what the lady is wearing doesn't feel like 
ogling on first read. It feels like no. excessive sort of categorical observation. Indeed. Which you might get away with regardless of whether or not you were looking at, staring at, ogling. Um, if someone were standing outside your house screaming the name Merla, <laughs> uh, and you invited them in as a politeness to use your phone. Um, but it can be both things, right? Like, there's a, there can be a predatory aspect, like, I'm taking this opportunity to not look like the freak in the situation in order to be predatory. And I think that's part of what is so compelling and sinister about where this story ends and the unfolding of that and trying to pin down where that begins and when this is sort of like, you know, sort of Greek, like ancient Greek storytelling where there's a lack of impulse control and where it's much more like modern storytelling where I'm like, dude, there were warning signs there. You know, like, um, is, is really hard to grasp. And I think that's something that Williams is succeeding at tremendously. Yeah, I mean, you know, as, as you've said, there are certain things that the story won't, won't answer. And, you know, I think that's part of the point of the story in, in, in some regards. Um, much like the pictures where the lady's looking at the pictures to see what's going on. You know, some pictures don't necessarily have things going on. Um, and if there is something going on, you know, how do you talk about what's going on? Like, there's people in the picture, it's a still life, it's just color. It's an absence of color, right? Like, so there's yeah. all these different, we don't know what's in all of the pictures. Um, though one of them is kind of described. I think, you know, I'm interested in not necessarily an answer for these things, but like how you think about the pictures, what the mess is doing by the door, why the living room's so splendid. And, and, and then finally, like, why trap this lady in the messy area yeah i think that there's something really i want to read a little bit again i feel like we're going to accidentally read this story out of order <laughs> because it's so short um yeah. but, I mean, that's so wonderful why not read it out of order a nice in a jumble <laughs> a nice picture she said to me she had gotten herself up she was looking at all of those men dressed for one of the dark age centuries, marching through foliage, trekking around a hunched up woman at a well with their weird insignias on their chests that nobody I know can figure out with their faces, version after version of the same face. Now, I think that like one thing that compels me about this, um, as, long, as well as we're gonna learn later on, like I cannot remember the dates or the royal reign to which she referred, that there's something about the way this narrator thinks, either the picture is not very good or interesting, um, or it's at least not for its size, or it's much smaller than the description makes me imagine, and or like the narrator hates the narrator's own picture which might also be true with any of those. And all of that confuses me a bit. Unless the insignia is like, I don't know, more striking than sort of like a Templar cross or something on somebody's chest. I don't know why the insignia is so mysterious. There's something about the way that the narrator processes information that makes this picture hard to comprehend. Or the picture is hard to comprehend but the narrator has chosen in any way and is a little disdainful of it which is an odd thing to do in a home where you live alone, presumably. Uh, most people don't go trapping people in a home that they live in with other people. Um, but, you know, so like all of that's kind of weird, but also the picture is more of this splendor thing, right? That's the word that gets used about this space. And then there's the jumble. And those are the distinguishing terms, splendor, jumble, splendor, jumble. 
I like it makes me I don't want to be diagnostic about the narrator. I don't know enough about the narrator, but it makes me think of I had a number of friends who have like OCD issues, right? And that whole like you meet someone and you like go into their their home and like the kind of casual term is like hoarder, but right, like you go into a hoarder's house and often there's like this is where I let people into, and it's very nice and it's very orderly, and then there's the part where I do my hoarding. And I think there is, for a lot of people who have relationships to objects that are complicated, the display area, this is what I want you to believe about me, and the disaster area, this is where my mind is, or this is where I put all the things I wish weren't in my mind, and this is the, the disorder. And I think there's something about this narrator that's trying to categorize the lady and put her into that space and like keep her into that splendor area and can't quite, and this is an overly psychological reading maybe, but like can't quite keep that lady there because something about, she's lost something about her beauty and her age, her socks aren't held up and she can't find her friend's house like she's supposed to. And whether or not this individual is looking to transgress, that that impulse control is actuated specifically by someone who almost makes the splendor and is also bombing out. Um, and I, I think there's something there, and it's interesting, we don't really get what the jumble is, but whatever the jumble is, is apparently, you could miss it as you passed in in a hurry to the phone if you were a fast person. But like, <laughs> Uh, but it is a jumble that bothers this person. Fast. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I think like we don't actually see it. We get that like hyper specificity about the painting that's also somehow unspecific, and that mixture makes it odd because the jumble is a jumble. But I think that's part of the, the sort of psychological process of the transgression. I mean, that's my my speculation. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess I would add about, um, I, I, I think you're right about the narrator and I, I love the word categorization because I think part of the reason other than, you know, just paying attention to details usually as a reader that we're pushed into that space is because this narrator is also really paying attention to details consistently and looking for meaning, I think it, it feels significant about the paintings that the narrator wants to comment on the insignia that can't be deciphered. Um, that this narrator is at once kind of reaching for meaning and um, defying, <laughs> defying our own reaching for meaning. Um, and you know, kind of, that there's this kind of push-pull in terms of wanting mannerisms, wanting civility, uh, wanting, wanting manners, rather, not mannerisms, um, wanting civility, um, wanting a certain kind of etiquette, and, and not wanting it, right? It feels important, too, that, you know, this woman is not only, not only has fake fur in her hat, but she also has a reproduction of the painting. Um, she's trying to comment on it but doesn't quite have her facts straight or the narrator isn't able to listen to those facts if she does have them straight but it's muddy in those ways um and you know i think I, because it's such a short story i i also pay attention to the fact that the and i mean this is i think in conversation with some of what you were saying, Adam, that the painting is a Dark Ages painting. Um, the Dark Ages are named the Dark Ages because <laughs> there's supposedly like very little culture coming out of them, but also you have knights in the Dark Ages and, you know, um, codes of honor and things like that, yeah. but this is unreadable in this painting. So, I mean, symbolically, you've got a little bit of that going on, but this also is a space that I think kind of like <laughs> the insignia is a little bit unreadable. Um, it's true that we don't know precisely what's in the jumble, and that's a decision I love. Um, 
I like it that I'm let into the story as a reader and allowed to imagine that jumble as I as I want to. I imagine a broom in the mix, kind of like propped up against the wall and maybe even, um, you know, like a dustpan kind of like with its like sweeping part off to the side a little bit. <laughs> well, you know, that's uh, that's very telling. Do you think... <laughs> No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I think first of all, I would say, you know, being a knight would be dark just by what you had to wear. <laughs> but the broom, <laughs> the broom is interesting because somehow this lady is held long enough to like resist struggling and like be still in this jumble area. Yeah. And, you know, uh, at the end of the story, there's also two statements, yeah. which I'll ask Ingrid to read here in a moment. Um, you know, what's going on? Why is it in like this? And is this yet another genre that Williams is toying with, the fairy tale genre, right? Because how big can this jumble area be? Yeah. Ingrid's already imagining a broom, <laughs> right? And we know brooms are, are, are in some fairy tales. Um, but, like, really, what's, what's happening here? Because the lady is somehow disoriented, and the narrator tells us that she's really only one to 200 yards from Merla's house, yeah. <laughs> but can't find it, even though she's been going up and down this street and yelling for Merla. Yeah. <laughs> Or is it an anti fairy tale? Oh boy. Um, that might be a heavier question than I'm ready for. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the interest of reading this, this whole story out of order, I'll read a little more than the two S final lines. All right. um, and then I had told this little person my wrong address, not because I wanted to, nor because of any need on my part to make up a lie. I said 270, which is way off the track, except for two digits, but I'd rearranged them, the seven and the zero, but I did not know I had done that. All that I knew was that I'd done something unforgivably uncivil. It was a lapse to reckon with. I took her into my arms so that she could never leave me and then jammed her up into the corner with the jumble by the front door and held her in there exhausting myself to keep her in there. I didn't care. It hurt her more than it hurt me to be a lady. Violence is never the problem. Love at first sight is. Um, Williams! Um, yeah. I guess one thing I wanted to note is that in terms of imagining that jumble, um, that that was my first read version of the jumble before I got to the ending. So I imagine the broom, but then there is a space that she's forced into, um, clearly. So there might be a broom in there. I, I'm not giving up my broom necessarily. You don't, huh? <laughs> no. But, you know, you, you're pushed towards something more like a little closet space or something. Um, and, you know, I sort of dodged your... Your question of why the narrator keeps um, the lady there, and um, I, I think that lie at the end um, is is a big deal within this story's short space, and I think the narrator clearly becomes upset about that. That that's a kind of transgression on the narrator's part, and. I guess I read um, the response to the lady as kind of coming all along and the lie wasn't what actually instigates this. Um, you know, it was happening as soon as the lady was invited in. As the story tells us, um, you know, we know by what she's wearing. But, um, you know, I, I guess psychologically I read like maybe some deflection um, in there, like um, self-anger, so I'm going to keep this person here and hold them close um, not let them leave me now that I've transgressed um, something like that but um, 
Yeah, but let's talk about the 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 end and that fairy tale aspect that I was talking about. Yeah, um, I think that I don't know. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and being deeply disturbed. Uh, I <laughs> oh, think if this were it's disturbing. Yeah, I think if this were like a Patricia Highsmith novel, right? Like there would be indications beyond the patterns of speech. The jumble would have a Chekhov's gun in it or something, and that would be part of how the story worked to help us understand that this individual is dangerous or has the potential to be dangerous. Um, and, uh, you know, also the, the narrator's queerness would be part of the motive for harm, right? Mm -hmm. Like, And, you know, it, which also makes me think of, say, like, Jonathan Dem or something, you know, like Silence of the Lambs and Buffalo Bill and all that, yeah. being like the the inability and to be a set. very neat pat explanation for violence. Um, yeah, I, I loved Silence of the Lambs as a movie. I think it's terrific, um, but I, I think that film and I've been watching a lot of Criminal Minds lately. Yeah. You know, like there, there, there's this <laughs> need to like reach for some kind of coherent explanation and to make desire and violence understandable. And I think some of what I love about this story is that, um, you know, it, it's not a desire that's easy to understand or explain to ourselves. Um, likewise, the violence. Yeah, and I think also in terms of what you're looking for, in terms of knowing who will and won't be scary, isn't terribly explained. And I, I also, like, I like Silence of the Lambs a lot, and I like, you know, um, I like a lot of Patricia Highsmith novels. I'm not bagging on it to say that, like, there's a neatness and coherence about that work that is meant to be neat and coherent. And I think one thing's ever, one thing I really love about Diane Williams is that she wants it to be open and messy while also giving you breadcrumbs to any number of trails. It's like one Ooh, of the breadcrumbs. Yeah. Those are fairy tale too. They are. And I like to stay with my Looney Tunes thing. Also, oh like I kind of imagine this being like a Bugs well, Bunny like sign where it's got like here. 50 different directions on it <laughs> that he's spinning around. And I think that that's actually where the fairy tale thing comes in for me, is that I think fairy tales, as well as incidentally, like, you know, this like particular theory of mine that like conspiracy theories function a lot like fairy tales, that their attempts to explain the unknowability of the world, which is different than just the kind of like, to your short, short question, right? Like the anecdote, which is like, don't go in the woods. Terrible stuff happens there, which is not a fairy tale, right? Something magic and much more complicated happens in a fairy tale. And I think the way in which this relates is if it's an inverted fairy tale, we're not, we're getting the witch's story. And yeah, the, that's what I was going to say about yeah. it fairy tale wise that makes it, it's fairy tale aspects like a little harder or. A, a little, a little subtler, a little hard, harder to see. Um, yeah, is is that perspective thing that um, you know a mutual mentor of ours and um, professor and fairy tale expert and writer Kate Bernheimer um, describes fairy tales as often being about survival, um, yeah. but they're often from the perspective of um, you know Hansel and Gretel trying to survive the witch, not the witch. Yeah, and I think a lot of the reason is if you, right, like, I know all these people who don't hike, but, like, know that I hike and will, like, offer me advice on, like, what to do if I see a bear, right? And I think that fairy tales are a little like that. It's like, what to do if you see a bear? But in this case, because the bear or the witch or what have you is speaking, you don't see this person and you get to, like, see the jumble and see the warning signs about the jumble having like too many women's hats or something in the jumble, right? But rather you see someone who thinks about it as the pejorative, but kind of like juvenile and fun jumble. And I mean, it may be something really terrifying in the jumble, or it may be like a pile of garbage, or it may be any number of things. 
so that we don't get the warning signs except that we get the witch looking at the child. Or, yeah, I mean, it's a complicated metaphor, and I've like really muddied the waters here. But I think the fairy tale often, where the warnings are, are in something like, you know, the Pied Piper. If you pay the Pied Piper, the Pied Piper doesn't take the children. If you don't like make this weird trade with Rumpelstiltskin, he doesn't come back for the kid, you know, like, and that kind of stuff. Um, where the magic elements have a semblance of warning and the warning isn't always like linear or clear and who's being wronged and who's not being wronged and where the social rules are aren't perfect. But you see this sort of like where safety could be and how you can protect yourself and move forward, how you can feel connected to the violences of the world through other people who have survived the violences and feel safer by narrativizing and sharing and taking part. And I think part of the weirdness here is that it, whoever this individual is, that weird last line about it hurt her more than it hurt me, that the only way to read it isn't that this is a female narrator violating a female, like, other. Um, which is why we keep bringing up the, like, gender issue that it can be that this person is hurting her because the hurt he knows a potential he knows that she's being hurt in a way but also that he he or she or they don't care because it hurts the other person more is a terrifying realization and it's it's a little ephemeral and i think in that way that there should be there should be breadcrumb trails to what this danger is. And we almost get there, but there is that, that psychological deflection of like, I didn't do it on purpose. It wasn't a lie. This is the, like, this is the reason. And then it just happened that love at first sight is the problem. And I, there's something so strange about that. And I, it's that I can't put the witch together because I don't get to see the warning signs. It's really weird to me and it's scary to me. Yeah, and I mean, I think some of why that, those final lines um, are stirring and create the kind of movement they do is because they don't seem to exactly fit together for the logic of the story. You don't expect the ending. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I think to, to um, push this, push at this fairy tale thing a little bit, um, you know, if, if what we're meant to understand is that love at first sight is the problem, it's, I think some of what this story is working out for itself is that, like, the way we're socialized is, is a problem. These, these civil yeah. manner, manners are a problem. Um, the way we're taught to think about love and desire in these uncomplicated ways and mannered ways are, are problematic. Um, I think, too, um, the word impulse control or impulses and impulse control have come up quite a few times yeah. I think the logical distinction between violence not being the problem and love at first sight being the problem and the order there I think um, is a very um, compelling fascinating and I mean uh, poetic like I like the first sight comes comes last in terms of order, but um, that, I mean, what, what that's saying to me finally is that, you know, like the way, the way I'm seeing, the way I'm socialized, the way that my impulses were already pointing are the problem, not the action that resulted that like that I was thinking this way and feeling this way in the first place is the problem. Um, it's, it's really deep and smart and I think really scratches at the root of things. Yeah. And I also think it hits on that to like punch at the fairy tale thing one more time is that like I'm going to stick with the Pied Piper of Hamlin as a, an example, which is that like that that story is the root cause of the problem is the rats 
right, that the Pied Piper is supposed to take away. And the sort of root moral, if there is one, is he should have paid the Pied Piper, right, which we still have that kind of language for, to pay the Piper. And then the secondary negative consequence is that the children get taken away. But part of what I think fairy tales do really effectively that this story does is for the children, presumably it's still a problem, right? Like, I mean, maybe they're dead and it's not a problem to them anymore, but presume, like often the people who suffer in a fairy tale haven't caused the issue, right? It's not an Aesop's fable. Um, and I think that this, this woman has found herself, maybe she did all kinds of terrible things to find herself looking for Merla on the wrong street. Um, but she didn't deserve whatever this individual has done to her. And I think that fairy tales deal with that kind of anxiety. And here we have someone trying to explain that anxiety away in a kind of Humbert Humbert way, both that it's plausible to do the thing because, right, like it hurts her more than them. And also it's like, not my fault because love at first sight is the problem wherever that love at first sight comes from and so the moral ends up being false right or it rings false and that's um and still there's something to learn from that moral about the thing and i think that's a tremendously interesting like thing about this story and the way that it functions and works and, and book and sales yeah no great job today friends uh I hope you will go read some Diane Williams. As you can see, less than three pages, we had plenty to talk about. In fact, it opens up more questions than it answers, which is, <laughs> which is part of the fun, honestly. Yeah. But uh, we will see you next time. Thank you again. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Matthew.